Hey, Joe Gilder here. Welcome to another round of Mixed Together. Finally going to get into fun stuff. So we've set up our mix in the first video. In the last video, we took a quick sidebar and focused on drum phase stuff. If you haven't watched that video, getting drum phase stuff right is not fun. But it's, as you can hear in the video, it does make a difference. And depending on the song, every song is different. Every recording is different. So, uh, you know, while it didn't make, it maybe made some night and day differences, it wasn't huge. But there are some uh, sessions I've mixed where making one of those changes completely changed how I could approach the drums and made it a lot easier to do. Okay. So today we're going to jump into mixing and actually setting some levels. Now, where I like to start with my mix, and if I've covered this already, I apologize. You may recall last week's video, I shot the entire video and then it, the file got corrupted and I had to reshoot it. So I, I covered some of this in that video and I can't remember what I did in real life and what got destroyed by my evil computer. But the way I like to mix, after setting things up and after doing some of that administrative stuff of getting the phase stuff figured out, um, I really like to start my mixes by spending as much time as possible on my static mix. Now, why do I call it a static mix? Because nothing's moving. Uh, there's no automation, really. There's, there's nothing going on here but setting levels with the faders, doing some gain staging with the audio itself, the actual audio file, turning it up or down, and then adjusting the pan positions of everything. Okay, That's all I focus on. 98% of the time during my static mix. So here's the here's the, the principle behind this. It's so easy, especially if you are somewhat new to mixing and you haven't done tons of it, it's very easy to pull up a song, listen for about two measures, and then grab an EQ or a compressor and start messing with stuff. And you never actually get a chance to, you never actually listen to the song. You just jump in and you start messing with stuff and you turn around four hours later and you've slapped plugins all over the place, but you actually don't have, you're not anywhere closer to a good mix than you were at the beginning. Now, that's not true of everyone, but f in my experience, a lot of people fall into that trap, myself included. Um, there have been songs in the past, years ago, when I was first starting out mixing, where I would literally turn everything down and just listen to one kick drum mic. And I would literally mess with that kick drum sound for 20 minutes. And then I would stop and move to the next kick drum sound. Okay, that's okay. And then work on that for... So you can imagine, I was exhausted by the time I got done with the drums. And as you can also imagine, when I finally listened to the drums as a whole... Nine times out of ten, they didn't sound very good still after all that work. That is really frustrating, and it wastes a ton of time. I don't like being frustrated when I'm mixing, and I certainly don't like wasting time, and I'm sure you don't either. That's why I think it's critically important to slap yourself on the hand every time you try to reach for a plug-in during this phase of the mix. Okay. Now, if I let me back up. For me, if I need to spend five, ten minutes on this static mix, setting levels and pan, or sometimes I'll spend as much as an hour or more getting this right. A lot of times it depends on the song. If I don't know the song very well, it's a new song from a client, then I've got to go through and decide, you know, here are three electric guitars. Where are we going to pan those? Is one going to be up the middle and the other two left and right? Or maybe we have a single keyboard part and we don't know where we're going to pan that. If it goes to the left, then what's going to be on the right-hand side to balance that out to keep everything balanced? Those types of questions and decisions have to be answered. And to me, it's critical to answer those questions early. You can never rehear a song for the first time. You can never rehear the raw tracks again. And in my opinion, for a lot of people, your gut instinct is going to be pretty good, especially if you have a good ear for music and you've listened to a lot of music and maybe you've played a lot of music, then you have kind of an an intuition as to where the levels and panning should be. If you feel like you have no idea, that's totally fine. I don't want you to feel left out. The point is, a lot of times i found my gut reaction to a song or to a track is usually a pretty good indication of where that needs to be in the final mix. So for me, although the static mix doesn't involve any plugins, to me, the bulk of the actual what makes the mix work happens during that static mix session. So again, it's all about moving faders up and down and moving panners left and right. 
Uh, sometimes when I'm doing this in Studio One, I like to change the view so I literally can't see the plugin window. I can just see faders and panners. Um, that can be kind of helpful as well. A couple of things I want to talk about really quickly. Uh, the first is metering. Uh, over here on the right hand side, I'll mute the audio and just hit play. But as you can see, if I zoom in down here, you can see this is a certain way of doing the metering in Studio One. This is your normal metering where the peaks are here and that white line is showing you the average level of the signal. This is K system metering set to K20. If you look along the right side, you'll see there are numbers with zero being right here. That is essentially an average level of zero dB below peaking in a digital system. Um, so with this meter, what you'll notice is the um, at the zero line, the signal goes from green to yellow. And then if we keep going louder, let me unmute everything, it goes from yellow to red. And it stays in the red for a while until up here we can see that we are clipping our mix bus. The whole goal of mixing, especially in this phase, is oh, not the whole goal, but one of the goals is to not obviously let your mix bus clip. That's one of the reasons why I like to do put all the faders up and get a good rough mix before I start doing any programming or not programming any plug-in work, because a lot of times plugins might add a little bit of volume, um, and you don't want to have your mix so loud that if you add even the slightest bit of extra volume, it goes into clipping. Then you play the game of you mix a little bit, then you see your clip light go off, you bring everything down a little. You mix a little bit, your clip light goes off, you bring it down a little. It's a frustrating cycle, and I don't, I don't see any reason to go there. For me, I like to mix at a fairly conservative level down here so that there's really no risk of me clipping. And the K-System metering lets me do that. You don't have to have K-System. Just as a, just a general rule of thumb, if you're mixing and you can see, okay, my peaks are hitting at negative one, they're just shy of clipping, that's just too loud. What I would recommend is going in, however you want to bring the volume down, bring it down to where you've got plenty of room, okay? This is giving me nine, six to nine dB of headroom there. To me, that feels like a much better solution than running it as hot as possible. There's no auto, audio benefit to running it as hot as possible, okay? So that's the big thing, keeping an eye on the meters and mixing everything at once so you know with everything going, I'm not clipping my main mix bus. Next thing I wanna talk about is as I go and do my static mix in this video, you're gonna see me adjusting faders, which is a given, but you might also see me adjusting the actual gain or the level of the audio files themselves. So you may see me come in here to where this bass DI track is and do something like this. I click on this little box and I drag it up and down. Now I'm adjusting the overall volume of that audio track as it feeds into this fader down here. So what I try to do when I mix is I try to have my rough levels at such, in such a place where my faders can hang around the middle or hang around zero, okay? So if we look at this fader, just a real basic thing, there's less resolution down here than there is up here. If I move this, like looking at my screen right now, that moving this up and down, by about that much. That's about a centimeter on my screen. I'm zoomed in a little bit, it's about a centimeter. So that gives me about a six dB difference in, in volume. Now, if the volume's down here and I move it the same amount, look, that's going from negative 24 to negative, oh golly, it's going from negative 28 to negative, almost a negative 48. It's almost 20 dB of volume difference. That's a huge volume swing for the same physical movement of the fader. So if you're late in the mix and you wanna just bump something up a little bit, well, moving this a tiny bit here is a lot of dB of volume change, which to me just, it wastes, it's, it, it's, it's a waste to have any fader way down here because you lose a lot of the resolution. I'm not talking about digital resolution or anything like that. I'm talking about actually physically moving this fader Moving it this much causes a huge amount of change in volume versus moving it the same physical amount here. Look, I'm moving it like this, and I'm going up and down about two or three dB with a pretty big swing of movement of that fader. To me, that's a much more forgiving position for the fader so that I can move it. If I need to move something up six dB, eight dB, I can. If I need to bring it down some, I can, but if it's as long as it's in this range, then I've got a good, still good range of motion to be adjusting volumes without losing that resolution. So for me, when I hit play, and you'll see me do this in a second, for, a lot of times I'll just pull up the faders and I'll hit play and I'll just see where things are playing out volume wise. If as soon as I hit play, I'm blowing out my meter over here on my mix bus, then I will bring down either all the faders themselves or more, more than often than not, I'll probably bring down 
the audio itself. So um, you'll see me do that from time to time. I'll be, let's say this this Ibanez track, which is just an Ibanez, uh, a hollow body, semi hollow body guitar. It's that one over there, the sunburst one, two over from the red one. Um, let's say when we start, it's too loud, and I pull have to pull it down to like negative twenty four to get it to feel right in the mix. Well, that's too low. So what I'll do instead is I'll go pull the actual audio file itself down so that when I leave the fader at zero, it's at a more usable, it's at a good, it's at the close to the right level and I can move the fader to make fine adjustments. Does that make sense? Uh, it's another kind of nerdy, simple thing, but you'll see me doing it. And if I haven't explained that to you, you might wonder what the heck is he doing? So there's no right or wrong way to do this. You don't have to follow my example at all. But if you're mixing along with me, then I would suggest doing it my way and just see what you like about it. You may like certain parts. You may not like others. Take what you like, forget the rest, and keep moving forward to get a good mix. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to unmute everything on my board, and I'm going to hit play. And what I'll do is I'm going to bring all the faders down. I kind of like bringing things in um, one at a time. I'm going to bring all my bus faders down. So everything's routed through one of these buses. I'm going to leave the drums up. And I'm going to set my drum level first. Because there's so many, we've already talked about the drums. I already have a basic drum level set from last week's video. I'm going to jump in a little bit more, get a good drum sound, and then I'm going to bring in the bass and bring in the guitars and start doing some levels and panning there. So I'm going to go through and probably listen to the song once from the top and then... Uh, I'll do some static mix while I'm doing that, and then I'll stop and explain what I'm doing and move forward, okay? So I'm going to turn my mic off, and we're going to start mixing. Another quick thing you might see me do, you might see the volume suddenly jump. Because I know I want to turn this up louder, I don't want to turn it up so much that I'm clipping the audio itself. So what I'll do is I'll hit a shortcut, which is Option N on the Mac in Studio One, which automatically normalizes this particular piece of audio. Normalizing just says, hey, here's the loudest part of the song of the audio. Let me turn it up to just shy of clipping, so just shy of zero. So now I'm at my max point that I can then bring it down to where I want it to be volume wise. Just a safety precaution to make sure I don't turn things up too loudly with this clip gain feature. Now I'm actually going to stop here, just real quick, I don't remember, but um, bass DI and bass amp, I believe we ran one, I can't remember how I did it, but um, I want to make sure these two are playing nice phase wise, so let's just listen real quick, back in mono, I think it's mono anyway, but let's just make sure. It's interesting. It's um, it's not obvious to me. Now, maybe obvious to you. When I look at the waveform, it looks like 
they are sort of out of phase. One's not quite lined up with the other one. It just looks different. It's, it's one's through an amp and one's a direct signal, so they're going to look different. But this one looks like it just starts. Yeah. So, again, I don't know. I can't give you a right or wrong. To me, there's a little more deep low end with the fl polarity flipped, and there's a little more mid-range with it not flipped. So I'm going to go with it flipped with a little more deep low end and see how that works. And that plug-in will always be there. I can take it off later. But to me, that feels like a good decision for now. So let's go back in and keep mixing. these to their own bus Okay, so working through there, obviously my clip light started to go off. And so for me, my solution was to select all the audio faders and pull them down a little bit. I could have selected all the audio files themselves, but there's this weird thing that happens when you do that. 
they all look kind of funny. See that line, that horizontal gray thing that happens? Um, I don't love that look, so I decided not to do it that way. It wouldn't be wrong either way, but to me, I just needed to bring everything down a couple dB. And in doing so, in the loudest section of the song, if I look at the meter over here, I can see we're just getting into the red. Now, again, this isn't clipping. This is just the K system metering is essentially, hey, most of the song should hang out right here where green meets yellow. As it gets louder, it goes into yellow, and the loudest part of the song should go into the red. And that's kind of where we're at there. And that gives me still a good chunk of headroom to increase volume with compression and things like that. But again, we've only touched volumes and faders at this point. A um, couple things panning-wise. To me, this is pretty self-explanatory panning, nothing really confusing. The Ibanez guitar needs to be up the middle because it's the main guitar, and I wanted it right up the middle. These two guitars, the Les Paul and the Tele, pretty much play together. So I have them panned opposite one another. And then the solo comes in, it's panned up the middle. The B3, it's an actual real uh, B3 Leslie cabinet with mics on top and bottom. I think we forgot to capture the bottom mic, which is fine for a song like this. So it, as you can see, it, it jumps around in volume, which is because Steve Peffer, the, the keyboard player, rides the volume um, pedal, which is great, gives it life, it lets it move. There are some spots where I might have to ride that back down where it gets a little too loud, and that'll either be something I do with automation or maybe I just chop up the loud parts and literally grab them and turn them down, something like this. But for now, I'm going to leave it where it is and try to just find a happy medium fader position for that, and then that'll be something we come down and adjust later. The biggest thing you'll hear on something like this is it's a pretty spiky vocal part. I'm kind of half yelling the chorus, and so things are jumping out. So it's going to need compression pretty soon just to tame down those peaks so that we can hear the entire vocal, So that but those peaks aren't coming through and causing issues, right? So um, that's something I'm probably going to reach for a compressor here fairly soon. So let's just go back to the beginning, and let's just work on some more levels, make sure we're happy. figure out those haze. I've got a plan for them production wise so the level's not too important right here but just make sure they're not too too loud. Hey. <laughs> hey. Kind of sounds like the oi in that uh what ACDC song is that? It's not for whom the bell tolls. Um the one's oi oi. Anyway. Reminds me of that. Okay. Okay, executive decision. Let's get rid of that. I'm, I'm not hearing any mid-range in the bass. I'm just here really deep low end and it's not cutting through, especially on this second verse part, which is a super cool part. 
uh, where the claps are coming in right here. That was becoming super thin because that's all mid-range. We took out some of the mid-range with the phase flip and that's just not working for me anymore. So we're going to leave it alone. Thought we might do that. You never know. That's the fun of this, right? Okay, let's keep going. Here's a great tip when you're setting th levels for things like bass. And it's one of those, bass is an instrument that you feel as much as you hear. And sometimes you're not sure, you may not be sure exactly what you're hearing. You know that it's there. You're not sure how it's contributing. Turning it up is one way to obviously hear it better and see what it sounds like. But if you want to really see what it's missing, or I'm sorry, you want to really see what it's contributing to the mix, one great way to do that is to mute it out. So mute it out and see what disappears, and that'll tell you what it's adding. It's kind of a cool way to leave it exactly where it is and just mute it to see what's going on. So if we do that here, so we can hear it's, it's holding down a lot of the low end, possibly a little too much. We'll bring it down a dB or so. Um, but great tool to put in your tool belt, mute things to, to see what they're adding as opposed to just trying to guess. It's really helpful.
right, so how do you know when you're done with your static mix? Well, if the tracks are recorded well, in which I mean, you can only really pull off the static mix. It can only work if the tracks were recorded well. If there are so many problems with the tracks, you know, let's say, you know, there's so many boomy tracks that need to be addressed with EQ before they're even listenable and things like that, then yeah, you might have to do some of that before you do your static mix. The, the takeaway lesson from that isn't that my approach to using a static mix first is wrong. The real takeaway is your approach to recording isn't great and you need to get better at that. Um, because I recorded these drums with Tim Horsley, who's a fantastic drummer. These were done at his studio, so he knows how to mic up and record them well. And because I am doing a good job here of recording the guitars and the bass and the vocals, everything sounds pretty good. Um, you know, the main guitar is dark. We're going to fix that later. It's the only track that I'm partially embarrassed about. Man, but it's thick and nasty. It just needs a little bit of that low-end warmth to kind of tame it down so it cuts through a little bit better. But in general, if you can get, if the tracks are recorded well, what I'm trying to say is you can get a pretty good sounding mix by just moving just adjusting volume and pan, okay? Yes, we're going to dive into things like EQ. I want to put distortion on that doubled lead vocal. I want to um, I want to do a cool trick with the haze in verse 1 at some point. Uh, I really want to make those guitars sound big and huge and punchy. I want the drums to get much bigger and snappier with some compression and some other things to make them really cut through. I don't want it to stay here, but if I, if I was working on this song for an artist and we just had our tracking day and everything's recorded and I sent this mix to him, he would be happy. He would know we're moving in the right direction. It can only go uphill from here, but even now it's a pretty dang good sounding song. So hopefully you are learning those kind of overall recording lessons as we work on mixing this song itself. Uh, but how do you know when you're done with your static mix? For me, it's when all I can hear are issues that can be addressed with compression, effects, EQ, and things like that. Um, if there, there are no major level issues... Uh, throughout the song. Now, some things might need some automation down the road and things like that. And actually, some people like to do automation in this stage. I've done that before. I don't think I need it here. It's a pretty static song. Everything is just kind of all out all the time. Not a ton of dynamic to the song, unfortunately. Or fortunately, it just rocks out. But um, I've just gone in and made sure you saw me go in and make sure the toms were loud enough so we can hear them during that um, kind of pre-chorus section towards the end. Uh, we've made sure we can hear the vocal, we can hear the claps, we can hear the tambourine, all the guitars are coming through, the organ is sitting pretty well there. Everything can be heard and everything sounds pretty good. To me, that's when I know I'm done with a static mix. I'm kind of, when I can dance along to the music and I'm feeling good about it, and I've only touched volume and pan, it feels pretty good. So once I'm at that stage, which I'm at now, I can move forward and do some of the mixing things. So we'll dive into some of our first steps in the next video. Uh, in the meantime, if you have not mixed this song yourself, head over to homestudiocorner.com slash MT for Mix Together and sign up to receive these exact audio tracks, pull them into your session, and mix them along with me. That's the whole point. Also, if you're just catching this series and this is the first video you've seen, head over to that same website, homestudiocorner.com slash MT, and the full playlist of every song, every song, every video in this series will be there as well. Okay, that's it for me. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week.